Today we're looking at a pretty cool number theory problem from the 2012 Czech-Polish-Slovak Math Olympiad. And what I think is cool about it is it involves two maybe commonly studied arithmetic functions. So let's dive right in. Our goal is to find all natural numbers in so that one of the numbers in phi of n and tau of n is the average of the other two. Now let's recall what phi of n and tau of n are. So phi of n is the number of numbers between 1 and n that are relatively prime to n. In other words, their GCD with n is 1. Then tau of n is the number of divisors of n, but we want them to be divisors between 1 and n. So I know this divisibility rule right here could hold for negative numbers as well, so we don't want to consider that, the number of positive divisors of n. Okay, so this is going to break down into two cases. The first case is when phi of n is the average of n and tau of n. And then the other case will be when tau of n is the average of n and phi of n. Now you might say, well, there should be one other case, and that's when n is the average of phi of n and tau of n, but I'll leave that to you to figure that out, why that's not really a case, why that simplifies very easily. Okay, so let's look at this case first. So I'd like to observe that this is going to break down as follows. We've got phi of n is equal to n over 2 plus tau of n over 2, so that's kind of obvious, and that is strictly bigger than n over 2 because tau of n is bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to write n with all of the evenness factored out. So in other words, I'm going to write this as 2 to the k times m, where m is an odd number. Okay, great. Now, I'd like to observe the following. This really kind of breaks into a couple of cases here. So let's observe that if uh, k is bigger than or equal to 1, so it's non-zero, we have the following. Um, we have 2 to the k minus 1 times m is equal to n over 2. I think that's pretty clear. We just divided that by 2. But then that's less than phi of n by our above inequality. But then that's going to be equal to 2 to the k minus 1 times phi of m. And here we're using this fact right here. So since m is odd, it's GCD with any power of 2 is 1, which means we can write phi of n as phi of 2 to the k, and then phi of m. And then calculating phi of 2 to the k, well, it's just 2 to the k minus 1. It's all of the odd numbers between 1 and 2 to the k. But now I'd like to observe the following, and that is we can cancel these 2 to the k minus 1s out here, and we have m is strictly less than phi of m. Now that may seem like a problem immediately, and we're going to prove that it is a problem, and that's by using a formula for phi of m. And there are several formulas for this, but I'm going to use the one involving the prime divisors in this case. So this is equal to 1 over 1 minus p1 multiplied up to 1 over 1 minus p sub j times m, where, and I'll just say this out loud, I won't write it down, these pi's are all of the prime divisors of m. So this is like a well-known formula for phi of m. But let's observe that each of these numbers right here that I am underlining in brown is less than 1. But that makes this whole thing less than m. But observe that if we just cut the middle out of this inequality, we have just shown that m is less than m. But that's a clear contradiction. And what did we contradict? We contradicted this assumption right here that k was bigger than 1. So that means, or bigger than or equal to 1. So that means k is equal to 0, i.e. n is an odd number because that means it has no two-ness, if you will. Okay, great. But now if n is odd, 
and we know n plus tau of n over 2 is a whole number because phi of n is a whole number, that tells us that tau of n is also odd. Now that may not seem like much, but that's actually really helpful because it's well known that the only types of numbers that have an odd number of divisors are perfect squares. That's because when you form all the factor pairs, you've got this one factor pair which is made up of, well, a number and itself. So the factor pairs that aren't that will give you two times something, and then the one on its own will give you a plus one. So anyway, you have an odd number here. So that means, like I said, that n is a perfect square. So I'll just say that it is a square here. Okay. And next up, what I'll do is I'll maybe clear my use of this k up here and anything with the primes before, and I'll write n with its prime factorization. So that means I can write n as p1 to the 2 times r1 times p2 to the 2 times r2 all the way up to pk to the 2 times rk where all of these p's are odd primes and they're distinct and notice I have even exponents here because I know it is a perfect square. Okay, so now let's see what we can do with that information. Thanks for sticking around this long in the video. If you're enjoying the video, make sure and give a thumbs up. And if you're not yet subscribed, consider subscribing. It really helps out. Okay, so far in this case, we've proven that n has to be an odd perfect square. So now let's see where that will take us. The first thing that I'll do is I'll take this equation right here and I'm going to rewrite it a little bit. So I'd like to write this as tau of n equals 2 times phi of n minus n. So I think it's pretty clear we can do that. And now I'm going to calculate the closed forms of tau of n and phi of n using uh, my prime factorization over here. So let's first calculate tau of n. So that's going to be the number of divisors of n. But notice that we can count this up as the number of times we use each prime. We can use p1 0 times, 1 times, 2 times, up to 2 to the r1 times, or 2 times r1 times. In other words, there are 2 times r1 plus 1 ways that we can choose an exponent for p1 in our divisor of n. And then that holds for all of those odd primes. So it's not a big leap to say that tau of n is 2 times r1 plus 1 multiplied all the way up to 2 times rk plus 1. Okay, that's good. And now what we'll do is use this closed form or one of the other closed forms for phi of n, the one that uses this prime factorization. And here we'll write this as 2, and then we'll have p1 to the 2r1 minus p1 to the 2r1 minus 1. And that product is going to go all the way up to p1 to the 2rk minus p1 to the 2rk minus 1. So again, that's this well-known formula for phi of n if you know the prime factorization. Then I've got minus n, but I'll write that with its prime factorization as well. So p1 to the 2r1 product all the way up to pk to the 2rk. Now what I'd like to do is factor out a greatest common factor from this right-hand side. And let's observe that I can factor a p1 to the 2 times r1 minus 1 multiplied all the way up to pk to the 2 times rk minus 1 out of this entire thing. And that's going to leave me with what? Well, it's going to leave me with 2 and then p1 minus 1 multiplied up to pk minus 1 and then minus p1 multiplied all the way up to pk. Okay, so that's where we are at the moment after doing that factorization. But now I'm going to build an inequality into this. Let's notice that this object right here is bigger than or equal to what we have with just these prime factors. And that's because this number over here is bigger than or equal to 1. I think it's pretty clear that it's bigger than or equal to 1. So if we strip it away, we find something that is less than or equal to what we started with. 
So let's write that down. So P1, 2R1, minus 1, all the way up to PK, 2RK, minus 1. But then all of these PIs are odd primes. So what I can do is I can replace all of these PIs with the smallest odd prime and push the inequality even further in that direction. So that's going to give us 3 to the 2R1 minus 1, all the way up to 3 to the 2RK minus 1. And now we're going to use an inequality involving exponential functions. And this is pretty easy to prove with calculus or maybe non-calculus methods as well. I'll leave that to you. And that is that each of these 3 to that power is bigger than or equal to 2 times r1 plus 1 all the way up to 2 times rk plus 1. Okay, nice. But look at what we've done. We've just sandwiched an inequality with the same thing on either side. This 2 times r1 plus 1 multiplied all the way up to 2 times rk plus 1. But that means that every step along this inequality has to be equal. And in fact, the most interesting for our purposes is this step right here. Because notice that that is going to imply that this object right here is exactly equal to 1. So let's bring that down here. So that means we know 2 times p1 minus 1 multiplied all the way up to pk minus 1, and then minus p1 all the way up to pk is equal to 1. But then just by distributing out this left-hand portion of the equation, we can see that an equation like this holds only in the case that k is equal to 1. But then if that holds only in the case when k is equal to 1, that brings us to this equation right here, which is 2 times p1 minus 1 minus p1 equals 1. But then that equation is pretty easy to solve, and we'll see that we get p1 must be equal to 3. But then that tells us that the solution in this case occurs only when our prime, well, we've got a single prime factor, which is a power of 3. In fact, an even power of 3. Now, let's see if we can restrict it down to a certain even power of 3. All right, so we just did a bunch of work and we determined that in this case, n had to be an even power of 3. Now, let's take it home from there. So let's observe that in this case, phi of n is going to be equal to 3 to the 2r1 minus 1 times 3 minus 1. And that's going to be equal to 2 times 3 to the 2r minus 1. So that's just using a standard formula for phi of n. Then, well, what's tau of n? We also know that tau of n is going to be 2 times r plus 1. And that's because we can just do a counting argument. We've got choices of exponent for 3, 0, 1, 2, up to 2 times r. There are 2 times r plus 1 total possibilities. Okay, nice. So that gives us this equation right here. So I'm going to maybe multiply by 2. So I'm going to say n plus tau of n equals 2 times phi of n. And then just bring this stuff down. So we've got 3 uh, to the 2 times r plus 2r plus 1 equals 2 times phi of n, but that's going to be equal to 4 times 3 to the 2r minus 1. So something like that. But now let's move some things around and observe that's going to give us 4 times 3 to the 2r minus 1, and then minus 3 times 3 to the 2r minus 1. That's from moving this 3 to the r over to the other side of the equation and then factoring a 3 out equals 2 times r plus 1. But now we can take the difference here and we'll see that we get 3 to the 2r minus 1 is equal to 2r plus 1. But then we can finish this whole thing off by moving over here to a claim. And I'll maybe sketch the proof of this, but we won't worry about it. And that is if r is bigger than or equal to 1, then we have 3 to the 2r minus 1 is bigger than or equal to 2 times r plus 1 with equality 
if and only if r is equal to one. So now how would the proof of this go? Well, I think you could maybe check the r equals one case, and you'll see that the r equals one case indeed does give you equality, and so you can stop there. And then you would make a base case for the r equals two case to build up an induction argument. So let's see, the r equals two case would give you what? So that's gonna be three to the four minus one. In other words, it's gonna be three cubed, which is equal to 27, which is most definitely bigger than, well, really strictly bigger than four plus one, which is five. So yes, it holds in the r equals two case. And then maybe you would finish this thing off with an induction argument, but I'm not gonna do that right here. So that means we know that r must be equal to one in our situation, which tells us that in the end, we know that n is equal to nine, three squared. Okay, so that covers this case. Now let's move on to case two. So for case two, we're in the setting when n plus phi of n over two is equal to tau of n. So we've switched the roles of phi and tau. And now I'm gonna list some facts, some inequality facts about phi and tau. These are fairly standard. You can find proofs of them pretty easily. And that is that phi of n is bigger than or equal to the square root of n over two, whereas tau of n is less than or equal to two times the square root of n. So like I said, those are well-known results. So now I'd like to build those results into our equation to build an inequality for n. So let's start right here. We've got n plus phi of n over two. So we know that that's gonna be e bigger than or equal to n over two plus the square root of n over four. That's just replacing phi of n with the square root of n over two. But then that's equal to tau of n, which in turn is less than or equal to two times the square root of n. So next up, perhaps I'll multiply by four to clear all the denominators. That gives me two n plus the square root of n is less than or equal to eight times the square root of n, which is equivalent to saying two times n is less than or equal to seven times the square root of n. Now we can continue moving things around and we'll see that this means what? Well, I think we're gonna have the square root of n is less than or equal to seven over two. Well, that means that n has to be less than or equal to 49 over four, but that means it has to be less than or equal to 12 because we need a whole number. And now at this stage, we just make a chart of the numbers between one and 12 and check which ones satisfy the rules that we need. So let's see, let's make a chart with n, and then we'll have n plus phi of n, and we'll have two times tau of n. And then of course, what we want is these last two rows to be equal. So let's build this chart, and then we'll look at it carefully. Okay, so there's our completed chart. And now what we have to do is look for, like I said before, the last two rows being equal. Let's observe that that happens when n is equal to two, it happens again when n is equal to four, and the last time it happens that is when n is equal to six. And observe by our argument right here, it will never happen after that. So that means that we can finish our whole problem off here with the three numbers that we determined from this case, as well as the one that we determined from the other case. So that means that n can be one, four, six, or nine. And that's a good place to stop.